for joining. Thank you. Uh, thank you everybody for joining this morning. Um, it is an early meeting for us um, for policy and innovation. Um, but again, welcome this morning to the Monday, August 30th meeting of the Policy and Innovation Committee uh, for SACOG. Uh, will everybody uh, please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the, to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And before we, we start, I, I just was thinking about this. Could we all just take a, a moment of silence this morning just to for a couple of things, for uh, the troops that obviously lost their lives in Afghanistan this past week, but also for all the firefighters and um, personnel uh, and, and families affected here in, in El Dorado County and in parts of other uh, counties as well, just uh, keep them in our thoughts. So if we could just take a, a moment of silence, thank you. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate that. Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, Renee, could we do roll call, please? All right, before roll call, just a few housekeeping items. Uh, as you may have just heard, this meeting is being recorded. But for our committee members, if you're not speaking, please be sure to mute yourself. And for any member of the public wishing to make a public comment, please use the raise your hand feature or press star nine if you're participating telephonically. And directors, uh, when I call your name, please indicate your presence. Uh, Director Bernasconi. Here. Burris. Here. Oh, let the record show Burris is here. Uh, Frerichs. Here. Gog. Yes. Lozano. Here. Middleton. Here. Stollard. Director Stollard, please indicate your presence. Yes, I'm here. Thomas. Here. Uh, Vice Chair Kozlowski? Here. All area. And Chair Saragosa? Here. We have a quorum. All right. Thank you. All right. Moving on. Uh, this is uh, public communications. Any person wishing to address the committee on an item not on the agenda may do so at this time. Uh, Robert, do we have any public comments? Uh, no public comment. Okay. Great. All right, moving right along then, we'll move to the consent uh, item uh, and approve the minutes of the August 9th, uh, 2021 meeting. Move to approve. Thank you, Director Gog. Thomas, second. All right, uh, thank you, Director Thomas, a second. Uh, any questions on the consent items? Any public comments? No public comment. Okay, uh, we'll go ahead and do roll call vote. All right, directors, when I call your name, please indicate your vote. Uh, Director Bernasconi? Yes. Burris? Aye. Frerichs? Aye. Gog? Yes. Lozano? Aye. Middleton? Aye. Stollard? Aye. Thomas? Aye. Vice Chair Kozlowski? Yes. And Chair Saragosa? Aye. Motion carries. All right, thank you. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and move on to our action item, uh, item two, and that's uh, to approve amendment one uh, to the budget and overall work program for fiscal year 21-22. Uh, and Loretta has this item for us this morning. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, Loretta Sue, Finance Director. Um, the purpose of this amendment is to increase revenues and expenditures by 576,000 uh, this is the result of the pricing pilot um, grant that we recently received from Caltrans. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Sabrina that she can give a little bit more information about this grant and the overview of the pilot, um, the pricing pilot projects that we are working on with two um, other MPO on. Uh, Sabrina? Thank you, Loretta. Good morning, committee members. Some of you may recall that we had a board luncheon on the topic of transportation pricing back in June. 
It's a broad topic with uh, some complexity to it, but we discussed the importance of needing to modernize the way we pay for transportation and that transportation is one of the only public goods that we use and pay for every day, but never actually receive a bill showing what we're paying. So we're excited to announce that we've received this grant to advance a pricing pilot that will test this idea of coupling transportation fees with incentives for using other modes. We, this is a Caltrans Sustainable Communities Planning Grant and in partnership with Caltrans, as well as the San Diego Association of Governments and the Southern California Association of Governments, we're going to jointly develop a common research design framework for pricing pilots in our, to launch in our respective regions. The results of this study will be useful for designing systems like a mobility wallet, where people could have all of their transportation options in front of them and the different costs or incentives for choosing different modes of travel. Caltrans is leading the changeover from a fuel tax to road charges through its uh, road user charge program. And results from our pilot will be useful in structuring incentive programs around that changeover, including addressing equity impacts of the changeover and assessing how it can change travel behavior. Our hypothesis is that people, if people are presented current information about what they are paying and what their options are for avoiding those travel costs, that people would be more responsive to incentives that change their travel in positive ways. So this project will cover the costs of designing a pilot, the research design, technology design, and user interface. And then we will, we and our partners will seek funding to actually launch a, a beta test and the full pilot in the near future. As we continue to coordinate with the state on the changeover from gas tax to road user charge, we know there's still a lot that we want to know and learn about the impacts at the local level, particularly around equity and travel behavior and this grant will help us design a pilot for that. We will be coming back to all of you to discuss pricing in various ways as we move through the process to update the Metropolitan Transportation Plan Sustainable Community Strategy, and we will bring updates on this specific project as it moves along as well. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Sabrina. Thank you, Loretta. Uh, any questions at this time? comments. All right. See not do we have any public comments? No public comment. Uh, I have one one question Sabrina uh, what's the uh, what kind of timeline are we talking about in terms of sort of from start to to finish here? Yeah, so we are um, aiming to have the work done in the next year and a half to 2 years. So we'll start work um, assuming the board approves at the board meeting, then we will launch into developing an RFP to get a consultant to do the bulk of the work and continue to coordinate with our partners and have final reports in um, June of 2023 is what we're shooting for. We're, we're looking to move as quickly as we can, but it, it is a complicated project to design, of course. Thank you. Uh, Director Koslowski. Yeah, I just, do we anticipate there being any additional complexity to it for having partnered with SCAG and Sandag? It seems, it seems like they have potentially much more complex systems to address. I, I, maybe not, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, there's certainly always a little more complexity when you're working with other partners, but we think that we're all in a very similar space in terms of what we're wanting to launch with a pricing pilot and that we could still have a core shared framework that would allow each region to then further um, refine the project to how they want to implement it in terms of the fees and, and incentive levels that each 
um, region would like to offer. So I guess my question was more about the number of, um, you know, individual communities that will end up having a voice in coming up with a program. And does that political complexity actually make it harder to come up with a program that's applicable across that vast region? Yeah, that, that's certainly something we're thinking about in terms of just our advisory committee, right? Like how, do, how broad do we make that? So we're hoping that we can have some groups that are representative of communities um, to hopefully not make it so big that we're not able to move the project forward. But certainly at that later implementation date, I think that's where the regions will just have to do more individualized work and outreach there. Got it. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. All right. Any other questions? Vice Chair Kozlowski, um, I, I know you serve in our mega region working group. And so you, you see there the coordination with the Bay Area and MTC and San Joaquin Cog. Just so everybody is aware, and particularly for this committee, um, I would say really in the last two years, the coordination as well between us and Southern California SCAG, the Association of Governments that covers the six counties, and SANDAG in San Diego, uh, we had the board tour there a year and a half ago, but um, we actually have some groups uh, between uh, advocacy and government affairs, innovation, housing, because we all face very similar challenges in some way, even though the scale and the scope for us is always, as we say, quite different here in sort of inland California and the Valley. Just, just an FYI, really, that um, I think it might be more complex, uh, but for some of the groundwork that we've been able to lay already. Um, so just, just in, in, in response to that, and maybe as a preview from some more things to come with this committee. Yeah, James, I was just thinking that there's a possibility that there might be some good ideas that get dropped off the edge of the table because they we might want to implement them but they wouldn't be broadly applicable that's all i yeah, really know no, that I, we'll, I, we'll retain some control we, obviously we, but we appreciate that and i yeah. and i i don't think that is our intention whatsoever i think it really is to kind of learn from each other and not sort of one size fits all the sort of this approach at all so stay tuned you'll you'll as sabrina outlined the the calendar for you. Um, you'll have you'll have several bites at this, and I, I think it's a really exciting pilot myself. Thanks, thank you, James, and thank you for reminding me that it was only a year and a half ago that we were in San Diego, which now feels about twenty five years ago. <laughs> so, with that, uh, if there's no more comments, I will uh, entertain a motion. I'll move approval. Thank happy you, Mike. To, happy to second that. All right. Thank you, Director Ferrix. So we have a first and a second. Any further comments? Seeing none, uh, roll call vote, please. All right. Directors, when I call your name, please indicate your vote. Uh, Director Bernasconi. Aye. Burris. Uh, Director Burris, please indicate your vote. Uh, absent. Director Ferrix. Aye. Gog. Yes. Lozano? Aye. Middleton? Aye. Stollard? Aye. Thomas? Aye. And Vice Chair Kozlowski? Yes. And Chair Saragosa? Yes. Motion carries. All right, thank you. Um, we will now go ahead and move on to our information items. Uh, and item three is our uh, regional telework uh, pilot outcome. Uh, and next steps. And uh, Ms. Moretz has this for us this morning. Thank you, Adrian. Good morning, committee members. Adrian Moretz, your state COG staff. This is an update on the region-wide telework pilot we have been bringing to you over the past year. So since mid-2020, which I agree does seem like a long time ago, we have been working with a small group of 10 participating employers in our region and our expert consultant team to try to understand what we might be able to do to maintain some level of telework in the long term and replace our commute trips with telework. So what we have learned so far, there's a strong desire to continue to telework from employees. So because of that, employers are gearing up for hybrid workplaces pretty much across the board in our pilot. 
We also know from the work of the Next Generation Transit Planning Study that many trips have kind of transition from commute trips to neighborhood trips, but there is an opportunity with telework to reduce vehicle miles traveled or VMT. And we have also learned that there's really a lot, a lot of variation in employers' approaches to telework. So what this means going forward is flexible telework policies and really strong outreach about transportation options should really be the standard for employers going forward. So although almost every employer in our pilot and outside that we have talked to um, has really different approaches to telework, including our state agencies, uh, we can really expect to see telework as part of our work culture in the long term. So through this pilot, we've conducted focus groups, We've provided policy review, we've prepared transportation plans, we have discussed IT strategies, studied employee behavior, and gave guidance on different approaches. So because of that, there's a few next steps for this pilot, collecting more data, sharing what we know, and hearing about different approaches from different perspectives in the region about telework. So in terms of data collection, we plan to resurvey or reassess our small group of participating employers in about six months. Originally, we had assumed that some of the concerns of COVID would have been eased by now and we would have a more clear picture about telework in the long term, but we need to continue this effort. So in about six months, we'll reassess our participating employers, really to see if the sentiment about telework is still as high as it is today, and just to collect information on current telework rates for those participating employers. So if you remember, um, we had collected data from our employee participating employers and before COVID, before COVID-19, so prior to March 2020, there was about a 7% rate of regular telework. During the pandemic, our participating employers, again, this is the small pilot, 10 employers, uh, that rate jumped to 90%. And then we asked, how much do you want to telework going forward in the long term? The rate was even higher, <laughs> even higher than 90%. So we want to assess in six months or so, um, is that rate still applicable? Is the sentiment from individual employees still that high? And how much are employers actually allowing telework at that time? And we don't have regional data on telework rates right now, but we know some partners like Valley Vision are conducting broader employer surveys. That concludes at the end of August. So we're continuing to get more data about what other employers are doing. And although our pilot is not representative of the region or the country, all of the things that we have learned so far have really followed national trends. So we can look to that, those as well. And of course, we'll be working with closely with our data and modeling team here at SACOG as we incorporate telework into our long range transportation land use plan, the MTP SCS, which you'll hear about later today. So that's data collection. In terms of sharing what we know, we're putting our learnings in a living toolkit on our SACOG website because so much is still changing. There's still uncertainty and a lot of flexible policies that employers are putting out right now. We wanna make a living resource for employers and employees, the general public and yourselves as community mem committee members. So this includes data we've collected so far. It includes resources for employees and employers lessons we've learned from this pilot. So I've started to populate this toolkit now. We plan to update it as we receive more information. We truly do want it to be a living resource. For example, we have not yet included information on telework as a strategy for things like bad air quality days, but that's certainly something we can include. So we'll continue to update it with pertinent information and data as we collect it through this pilot and as we receive it from outside sources. We're also currently working on closeout conversations with our participating employers, really to see how effective our assistance was, even though there's still a lot of change and, and COVID is still a part of our reality, but we still want to see how effective the assistance we provided was, um, how employers compare with one another, so what each other are doing in terms of their telework approach, and then what additional support might be needed down the road so we can continue that in our long-term planning for this pilot and outside of strategies for telework. So that resource is at sacog.org slash telework. Well, again, we started to populate it. We're going to continue to build it up. And then finally, in terms of hearing from different perspectives, we know that you as committee members, our participating employers and the general public really are interested in what others are doing, how people are approaching telework, 
what's happening from all these different perspectives. So in coordination with our communication team at SACOG, we're planning to conduct a series of short conversations with different groups around the region and provide a complimentary series of stories in our newsletter, The Current. So these fireside ch chats of sorts will really allow us to hear more directly from different perspectives. So for example, from an economic development perspective, we might talk to Downtown Sacramento Partnership, which is a business improvement district because they're offering an incentive for people working in office. For our participating employers from this pilot, we might talk to Caltrans. They're rolling out a telework program division by division for 20,000 employees. So we plan to have these conversations across transit, our participating employers, um, and other local entities from the economic development perspective and more. Um, and you know, although our technical assistance in this pilot specifically is wrapping up. The focus on telework is not over by far. We still have a lot to learn. So um, to, to conclude my presentation, I'll say we're trying to figure out how innovative mobility uh, program incorporates telework. What's next for the telework pilot? Is there a phase two, if you will, that focuses more on transportation, more specifically on what we can do for employers? We did present that framework next month, and it does include a line item for telework, so we're going to figure out what that means going forward. Also, um, what's next for our transit team internally at SACOG, they're having conversations with transit agencies and GovOps, which is a state agency, to understand more fully what's happening at the state level and how that affects transit ridership. And then from the data and modeling perspective, again, um, our team is gearing up for including telework as a commitment mode in our long-term transportation uh, strategy. So lots of stuff still happening with telework. Our immediate technical assistance is wrapping up, but we still have a lot to learn, a lot, a lot more to go. So we're going to continue to update that telework toolkit on our website as a resource. And of course, if there's pertinent information, we'll bring that back to you as committee members. So with that, I'll take questions. Sorry, getting myself off mute. Thank you, Adrian. Uh -huh. uh, any any uh, comments or questions? Uh, yes, um, Director Lozano. Yeah, I have a, a quick question. Um, Adrian, you spoke about uh, talking with the downtown partnership um, related to uh, the effects of telework. Um, uh, but have we looked at the uh, participating agencies and the businesses, local businesses around those specific areas and, and how that's being affected. And I recognize that, you know, uh, COVID is still happening and, and uh, it may not all, uh, the, the, the businesses may not all be just affected by telework, but by other, other pieces. But uh, have we looked at that and is there a way to include that uh, moving forward so that, um, and again, my fear is, is that um, we support telework, we do all of these things to provide resources for businesses to have more telework, uh, yet we cannibalize some of our local, local businesses due to that. Yeah, thank you for bringing it up, Director Lozano. So from the conversation perspective, we want to talk to Downtown Sacramento Partnership, but also the Chamber, GSEC, Greater Sacramento. Greater Sacramento Economic Council and other entities that have more boots on the ground relationships with those local businesses and employers. So our pilot did have a combination of private and public employers, but leaned heavier on the public side. So from you know, businesses tell in their telework rates, we have a small glimpse into that, but we want to have more conversations with groups like the chamber who are really more closely related to those local businesses. From the more true economic development perspective and how local businesses are affected by telework. Our consultant team did endeavor on an economic assessment, so they're still wrapping that up. Um, you know, lot, <laughs> lots of learning still happened even in the last few months, so we'll put that on our, our toolkit and present it to you. The interesting thing is, you know, we have a little bit of local data on, you know, uh, participating businesses, how, how much people supported businesses during the pandemic, but we also have to complement that with national data. So it's an interesting kind of combination. So yes, we are looking into that and um, we'll be sure to let you know as, as we make that information available on our toolkit. So we, we did do, it's not a, a, a full in-depth assessment simply because the situation we're in now is abnormal. And so 
having 10 year projections or a longer term understanding of what might happen to local businesses because of COVID. We just don't know yet. So there's still a lot of uncertainties, but we are looking into that. So. Yeah, I appreciate that. I would just like to see uh, moving forward that that being one of the priorities um, only because, you know, there has to be a balance. I, I think you're right in that telework is here to stay at some level. Uh, and depending on the, the, the type of uh, industry or businesses is, is going to kind of drive that. But certainly government uh, has has taken a big lead in that. So I appreciate it. I just would like to see that moving forward being, being a focus as well. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, Vice Chair Kozlowski. Hey, I was just thinking that um, we might be able to adopt some of the ideas from um, LEAD for buildings um, and basically create a self-reporting you know, average miles per week commuted per employee by industry and let the companies do the reporting in order to win an award. And maybe we can, you know, host a party and uh, give out awards for, you know, each of the healthcare, the healthcare business that had the lowest net commute time. So we get people, you know, we get, reward them for getting, getting people out of their cars. And it would, you could probably get, gather some data on the telecommuting at the same time by how you ask them to report it. You might get a wider swath of reported data that way. Just suggestion. Yeah. No, I was kind of thinking along the same lines, Mike, in, in terms of capturing those VMTs anyways, uh, you know, as we look at our long-term programs and, and what we do, but you're right. I mean, there's ways to potentially incentivize it just like you would with a lead building uh, and be able to give that sort of, uh, affirmation to private businesses and public agencies that yeah, do building it. building owners have gone really around the block to get that you know five hundred dollar silver plaque for their office so just an idea oh sounds good uh director stollard uh, thank you uh, i think it's very interesting that at the, at the outset of uh a sheltering in place uh, we want, we set up this program to encourage continuation of telecommuting after uh, the COVID era ended. Uh, ironically, it's almost like, how are we going to get people to even ever come back to their offices? It's, it's totally flipped. If you think about it, before the Industrial Revolution, people all lived and worked at the same place. Families stayed together. And that was the nature of it. It was the industrial revolution that separated the working persons from the families and created locations. Well, here we are, technology, which has already replaced so many things, uh, is perhaps replacing the need for, for bricks and mortar offices. And uh, I know many employers now are struggling to figure out how to get their employees to come back to the workplace. I have a couple that are home that love staying home. They don't really want to come back. Uh, I have choices. In some cases, employers have to accommodate the worker because if you don't do what they want, they go somewhere else. Um, I, so I, I guess what I feel, I feel like we're on the edge of a real social revolution here. Uh, I wonder how restaurants can continue to serve lunches anymore. Uh, will they have enough people? I mean, the overhead with $15 an hour minimum wage and everything else is I think I see is basically killing lunches at nice restaurants if they even can survive. Uh, I, I worry I'm on the board of the uh, Yolo Transit District. Uh, we're, we're right now at about 25 to 30% of our pre-COVID uh, ridership. <clears throat> uh, clearly uh, with people staying home, uh, the, among the transit user community too, it makes it uh, more challenging to uh, deal with the economics of, of operating transit. So I feel like uh, the can of worms is open and the worms are crawling everywhere. And it's going to be pretty interesting for all of us. But, uh, you know, I, I'm sure all of us now, uh, once this, we'd had the lightning up before Delta, uh, have gotten back in, together in various contexts. And it feels really good to be with people again face-to-face, -face, as much as this technology uh, effectively uh, has met the need in the interim. But I'm not sure that's enough to cause people to want to bother paying the cost of, of commuting and childcare and everything else that, that they've been able to avoid uh, in this era. These are just my observations that uh, it's like what Adrian tried to accomplish has been better than accomplished. 
uh, we're really uh, creating a social revolution. And I'm kind of wondering how it's going to play out. I got to downtown Sacramento two weeks ago for the first time in 17 months. I was pretty shocked by what I saw. The homeless have taken over. It's, it's just unbelievable. Also adding to the disagreeable aspect of even going down there for people. So uh, we certainly don't want to hollow out our central cities, our business districts and things like that. So we're policy people, you know, we have to think about these things and, and figure out how to make it work so that we don't uh, literally throw the baby out with the bathwater on this. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Tom. And I, I agree. I mean, I, I'm in my office today on K Street and it, it is, it's sad when, I mean, it's such a weird juxtaposition because I come in and there's tons of construction going on. And I, in fact, I couldn't even get into my parking garage because both ends of my, of my alley were blocked by construction trucks. So I had to get angry this morning and finally get someone to move. But um, it, it's just a weird feeling because you have that and then you have sort of the homeless. I mean, it's not a, atypical to have to have someone move from in front of our door. Um, and then you have all, I mean, there was a couple of restaurants across the street for me on K that were sort of still open. And then the, over the last four weeks, they both closed down. They just couldn't sustain it any longer uh, and, and have closed uh, their, their locations here on, on K. And it's, it's uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, I think there's gotta be that balance between allowing people to telecommute and, and, and that being a desirable thing and at the same time not hollowing out our, our center. So Adrian, I didn't know if you could comment at all about kind of, and I, I was talking to a, a, a pretty high level bureau chief for the state uh, this, this last past weekend and her frustration with um, trying to get some of her employees to come back. Uh, and, 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 you know, for her, it was, it was much, it, her ability, what she does was much better to have her folks sort of in person uh, in order to, to get, I think, to maximize what, what they're doing. Um, and it was just, you know, it, it's, it's just a tough go right now. And I don't, I'm just wondering where um, sort of our state and county partners are, uh, because I do, I worry about the long-term effects for downtown Sacramento as it takes, you know, when does, when do we turn that corner here? And then I'll, I'll let Adrian go there and then I'll go to Director Gog. So Director Saragosa, a lot of uncertainty still even among the state agencies. What we heard and collected data on and are continuing to hear from our small group, again, it's not representative of the full region, but we do have a, a pretty diverse set of employers in our pilot, is that pretty universally there's a hybrid approach going forward. Employers know that telework is a valuable asset. People like teleworking, they wanna keep doing it, but there is value to being in the office at least some of the time, the camaraderie, um, getting things accomplished, you know, there's a, a give and take there. However, many of our employers are just trying to get by right now to understand, uh, you know, how we accommodate telework and work culture in the pandemic when childcare and school and so many things are still in flux. For example, one of our participating employers had a temporary policy they unveiled a few weeks ago for their employees that said, okay, we'll start bringing you back one day a week. We know telework is here to stay. We wanna accommodate that and we'll start this hybrid approach. They've since updated that again. That was just to get them to December so they could get a longer term plan. And they've already updated that because of just restrictions and, and what's happening in the region. So that's why there's so much uncertainty. There is definitely an interest in the hybrid approach. I think that's what we'll see in the long term. We saw that in our pilot. We see that kind of nationally as we hear about studies um, or different employers, large and small. So I do think that there will be a combination of telework and going to the office. At what rate, we're not sure that will likely be employer by employer, so employers can have their own flexible approaches. So I think that's what we'll see in the long term, but even now, and I think even the next few months, uh, we'll see just these continuous high rates of telework just due to COVID-19 uncertainty. So it would be nice if there was one universal vision for counties or for the state, but even state agencies are approaching it differently. There's um, a nice dashboard that the state had put out to say, here's how many people are teleworking here. At, how's it changes by week? That's only 15 state agencies. And so it just goes to show that there's so much, um, you know, change <laughs> happening almost weekly that we don't know what we don't know yet. So it's our job to say, here are the tools and resources that we have and we can provide to you. 
we can do our best to understand how it affects local businesses or how employers are reacting to different restrictions or telework going forward and then you know continue to share learnings outward but still so much change that it's almost like employer by employer in their approach thank you adrian uh director gog uh, thank you michael i just want to say that farming is real tough business there's no telecommunication telecommunication involved in there. If you don't have labor, your crop can sit on the trees or on the ground and you can go broke in one season. It doesn't take long because you have so much investment into your uh, uh, producing your crop. If you're growing almonds, you can do 100 acres with two people, real easy work. Walnuts, you can do the same way, but if you're growing like peaches, that's a real labor intense. You'd have to have 30, 40 people there to pick peaches for you. And we, there's such a shortage of people this year just to thin the peaches to start out with, uh, real difficult time. Normally we'll be paid a three or $4 a tree. In the past, this year it cost $8 a tree to thin the peaches. And I was afraid to ask my contractor what he's gonna charge me. Um, I'm very fortunate to uh, be dealing with a good contractor that was providing me ample amount of labor all the time. But my friends, they don't have a good connection with their contractor and, and they were hurting for the quality of work that the people they hired to perform and they had to go back and rethin their peaches again and again twice so they can all size up. And then when it comes to picking peaches, it was real difficult to get labor. And again, I was fortunate by my friend, I got done a week before he did because he could only get three, four or five people to pick for him where my contractor, he brought in 40 people and picked more than what I wanted to pick in one day. And I found it difficult for me to take the crop to the station because it had to be there at, by five o'clock uh, so it can be graded and sent to the cannery for canning. And, and I just want to say that keep the farmer in mind because that's where your food's going to come from. And um, hopefully they'll design some good equipment that could be uh, used to eliminate some of the labor. But right now, the way things are that uh, without labor, uh, we're just having really difficult time. And hopefully, maybe our government can pass some good immigration policies that could help us uh, move forward in farming. Thank you so much. Thank you, Director Gog. And it's a good reminder of not not everything is um, can be accomplished on a on a screen, um, and takes human capital, especially in our ag side. And, and you're absolutely right. We've all been waiting for immigration uh, policy since 1986. So uh, it'd be nice to to see something actually happen. Uh, although I'm not holding my breath, um, I thought we'd see something the first year, but I think circumstances as it is has pushed any immigration deal at least into the next year. But well, we shall see. Sure, Sarah goes and unless there's any other board member comments, I just had a couple of thoughts yep. on this topic. Um, uh, really, really good and interesting discussion as this one always is. Uh, so just a few points as, as Director Gog just, I think really uh, hit 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 the point home. Uh, we are we are very aware that when we talk about telework and the people's ability to telework, we are only talking about a, a a big but only a segment of the population, right? And so we have to be very mindful that there are still many many jobs that that, that telework is not actually even a possibility. And there's a there's a there's a an equity factor, right? In just our our, our focus on the populations, the white collar populations have that ability. So, so thank you for that reminder because it's really important that we don't, we don't uh, wrongly assume certain things. Um, secondly, uh, I mean, Director Stoller has made this point before and it's a really good one, which is, um, and I will say again, sort of the, you know, the confessions of the recovering transportation planner. We have, we have asked people politely for decades 
to do something different and change their behavior and work from home. And it has failed, frankly. And I don't want a pandemic or a global recession or anything else to cause a change in behavior, but lo and behold, this has caused a change in behavior, right? And um, and it took that, frankly, um, on the transportation side. And the question I think that Adrian and many of us are on our uh, folks we're working with on this pilot project are trying to ask is, how do we get it um, how do we get intentional? At first it was, how do we get to stick? <laughs> so that once, you know, originally the uh, assumption last summer was when, when COVID goes away soon, right? We don't go back to our old habits. Well, um, the, the length of this pandemic, I think is beginning as you all are noting to make those changes. So I think the question in my mind now is, how are we intentional as Adrian was saying about a hybrid approach? How are we, how are we helping our public sector, our state employers, our private sector employers get intentional so that when this does, we get through the other side of this, there is a more, we are able to actually support employers and employees that we can be more intentional. And frankly, even gets to what Sabrina was saying earlier about our pricing pilot, you know, uh, it would be really important for us. And one of the cheapest ways that we can actually look at predictive congestion, predictive traffic is to be able to actually turn a dial on telework and, and to get more, to buy, te buy telework is probably one of the most co effective congestion strategies. And then finally, just again, uh, many of you have noted this, but um, obviously with everything that we work on and we help your staff and your communities work on in terms of vibrant communities, thriving walkable places, thriving downtowns. Um, th this is a huge concern as you're, as you're all articulating. And I don't, I think we have to be eyes wide open about the future of downtowns and main streets and everything else. And um, you probably all are seeing this. I, you know, maybe the jury is still out, but the fact that, Sac that downtown Sacramento, the urban core has gone so big on housing is, Thank goodness they have done that. That is uh, filling office spaces that are not going to be filled with employees in the future, but with people, with residents. Um, and so I just, again, I think that's we, the, the, the old formulas and the old assumptions, right, are, are, are being thrown out the window. But I also think that in its place, perhaps come up opportunity where we can see those and the ability to, uh, well, produce more housing, get more people uh, to live in our uh, around our main streets and our our employment centers, but also even do conversions of commercial to residential or to mixed use, I think is going to be a critical strategy. So, excellent discussion. Really appreciate it. Thank you, James. Uh, kind of wrapping that up for us and bringing it full circle. Um, so again, Adrian, thank you for the presentation. Um, that is a, an information item. So we'll go ahead, unless there's any other comments. All right, seeing none. Uh, we'll go ahead and move to item four, which are, is our advocacy update. And Sabrina has that for us this morning. Thank you, Sabrina. Hello again. Thank you, Chair and committee members. So we have our federal lobbyists here today, Devin Barnhart and um, Jason, I think, may be joining us as well, Jason Pavlicek. But I'm going to kick it over to Devin first to give a federal update, and then I'll give a state advocacy update after that. Great, I am just sharing my screen. I'm gonna keep my video off because Lord knows. Um, so a couple of these slides at the beginning are gonna look familiar for those of you that have been on sort of our last two presentations, but I do find it's helpful to help reorient folks to what specifically we're talking about because as things get reported in the press, and they are likely to come up a lot this month, um, as there's a lot of activity, they all get muddled together. And so it's really important for to know sort of what they're talking about when they say infrastructure, they say Biden's plan, this is us. Um, as a reminder, the bill that we are most focused on that has a ton of transportation money is that almost 1 trillion small circle on, um, in the darker blue. And what we're talking about this month, what Congress is really focused on is this big picture 3.5 trillion dollar social infrastructure package. Sometimes they call it family infrastructure, soft infrastructure, um, but we're going to refer to it as reconciliation because that's the special process by which it can pass Congress and will frequently come up in sort of any conversations around it. As a quick reminder, 
The smaller hard infrastructure bill is everything you might imagine that we're used to calling infrastructure, broadband, water, transit, rail, et cetera. It's bipartisan. It has already passed the Senate. It has not passed the House. On the big side, the 3.5 trillion soft infrastructure is a whole host of things, including schools, support for families, healthcare infrastructure. Um, there's likely to be um, funding around natural disasters, etc. Um, it is a partisan bill. It's Democrats only, Democratic driven, um, and it is a multi-step process. And we're just sort of in the beginning of it. But this month is going to be a lot of action moving through that process. There there is a small Venn diagram, overlap in the Venn diagram, I should say, where um, there might be transportation funding that ends up in both. Um, all of these bullets here are incorporated in the infrastructure bill already. Some of them may end up in the reconciliation bill, but it's sort of a question mark. So we are talking to folks pushing for certain types of funding um, to support some of our priorities, um, but it's, it, I'll explain in just a couple minutes that it's still not sort of set what's gonna be happening. One quick reminder about reconciliation. It is a special budget process. It has its own set of rules. It's not a normal bill. You can't just stick anything into it. You have to be very careful. Otherwise, if you're not, people can do a budget point of order and strike out something that you've incorporated. So they, they follow a very fine set of rules that make it very confusing to folks as we sort of work our way through. Nothing you all need to know here, except that it's um, it can be a pretty annoying process. Um, so it's it takes a little bit of time. As I said, it's a long process. It requires the bills to go back and forth a couple of times. Just as a reminder, we're in this second part here. There's still some more stages to go, but important thing to know about this second part is this is where the committees write the exact text. So we'll have a much clearer picture as we move through the month about what's gonna be in the bills as that text comes together. Um, I, I couldn't find like enough question marks to put on this slide for what's in the bill because a lot of it is still up in the air. Everything from the size of the bill, it's we say 3.5 trillion because that's what the Senate Budget Committee agreed to, but it takes 50 votes to pass. There are 50 Democrats, any single one of those Democrats in the Senate could say, I don't want it to be that big. Um, and uh, Senator Sinema already has suggested, Senator Manchin has, has made similar references that they don't want the bill to be that large. Some of the moderates in the house have said similar comments. And so it's just question mark still, we'll see. It's still a very large bill, but we're not sure how large it's gonna be. Substance of the bill is up in the air. That's what's getting sorted out this month. Um, <laughs> the votes are up in the air because the couple of democratic factions are fighting with each other about what should be in it and when it should pass. And so, um, whether they have the votes to pass it is still a question mark. But one thing to flag, folks have been pushing for earmarks to be incorporated. I, I think it's pretty set in stone that that would be a huge challenge in the Senate for the rules. And so you might hear people talking about earmarks, but it is um, highly unlikely that they would be incorporated. A couple of things to flag about topically what we know is in this bill. These are big buckets of issues that are going to be in the bill. Um, just to give you a sense, there's a huge bucket for health care, child care, pre-K, um, school infrastructure, assistance with tuition, also um, uh, things around technology and healthy ports. Climate is a big one. It'll make its way. Um, what is this? I'm having some sort of trouble getting this to move. There we go. Um, Housing, rental assistance, land use, and transit. This is all in the banking committee's jurisdiction. We're really focused on this pot of money. Um, ag, a ton of rural development funny, money for those that are interested. Um, a ton of money around child nutrition. Tech and transportation, that's a big giant pot, but basically what they mean is there might be additional broadband service. We don't know what the transportation bucket might look like. Um, manufacturing, this can be an important one for any folks that are um, sort of watching some of the regional technology hubs or any sort of other of the manufacturing partnerships. Um, and then it, lots and lots of democratic support for more climate money, more weatherizing, um, whole host of like buckets that, that individual pots could fall into, but we don't know exactly what they're gonna look like. Um, so important thing to know for why we care about this bill, there's a couple of big picture reasons why everyone's talking about it. One, this is the president's priority. Between the hard infrastructure and soft infrastructure, this is his Build Back Better program. 
that he has been pushing since he was in office and even before he was in office. It is a big deal to him. He wants a win on this. And so Democrats are really pushing for this to move forward. It's also a huge influx of money to states and communities, um, both on the infrastructure side, but more importantly, a lot of those social programs that haven't seen a bit of influx of money in a long time. This is the one big shot to get that funding. And then last and most important, I think to us is these two bills are politically linked. So um, you, at this point, we won't be able to pass the infrastructure bill. Um, it's unlikely that we would be able to pass it unless we also pass the reconciliation bill because the progressives in the house have said, I'm not gonna vote for infrastructure, hard infrastructure, unless you also pass reconciliation. And so for us, it's, it's important that both bills are, are moving forward or that there's a plan for both bills um, so that this hard infrastructure bill can come to fruition. And then for you guys to think about on timing, it all, it feels like all of this money is moving immediately. It's coming tomorrow, but we do have a little bit of time. So I want to give you sort of like a reasonable sense of like what's coming and sort of when you should be thinking about things. So for the first half of September, the house is going to be working on all the details of the reconciliation bill, the Senate that hasn't put out any timeline of dates, but they are purportedly also working on it. Um, part of getting reconciliation passed also meant that, um, the Speaker Pelosi had to agree to a date for the infrastructure bill. The date that she agreed to is September 27th. I think this is the soonest possible that we could see that hard infrastructure bill come up for a vote. Do we have the votes? Question mark, we can maybe, um, but that's the soonest we could see it pass. So that's the end of next month. Um, there's a potentially a vote and we could see potential passage. If it passed the house, the president could sign it and it could go into effect you know, a week or so after that. So the earliest we could see any of the infrastructure stuff start moving is really late September, early October. That could change, but that's, that's the going plan right now. A um, Couple of other things to note is that surface transportation, that's the bill that we currently operate under, um, that our highway and transit money comes through, that expires at the end of the month. So it puts pressure on folks to move this new bill, to move the infrastructure bill. Um, and then sometime this fall, the committees are really racing, we, we will see a potential reconciliation vote, we just don't know when that's coming specifically. Some important things to note is that September has a whole host of other problems that come with it. Federal funding, so all of the um, federal agencies that get funding, all of the grant programs, all of that funding expires at the end of September. There's debt ceiling that needs to be raised, which is a huge bill that has to move through Congress. Unemployment expires in September. The January 6th investigation is ongoing and has some key um, timelines. The anniversary of September 11th, the eviction moratorium. Um, this doesn't even account for things that are happening in Afghanistan, things that are happening in New Orleans and with the, the fires. Um, so there's just a host of really challenging issues coming up in September. So there's gonna be a lot of noise about things that are happening um, and it's just going to really be an active month so there's going to be question marks through this month but hopefully the next time we talk to you are getting pretty close to that we're going to have a little more clarity about what things are looking like and what timelines are going to be so a couple of last things to note um, for folks to think about as we start thinking about like once that infrastructure money comes like what what should we be planning on what's realistic timing so one, this is a super fluid process. Everything is sort of subject to change because of all those extra activities that are happening in September and all the work that needs to be done to get both infrastructure and reconciliation over the finish line. So um, just a little bit of patience as sort of Congress works through that process. The other is that no matter what happens, this is a gigantic influx of money for the agencies. It will take them time to put that money out the door. Will They will certainly be racing to do so. They, they want that money to flow quickly to folks. It's just such a big increase over what they normally see that it's worth noting that even when this bill passes, it's just going to take time, particularly any of the um, grant programs. They all require um, something called a notice of funding to go out that tells people how to apply for them. There's a whole process that's in place that needs approval. And so those are just going to take time um, and, and likely into the new year. Like we may see some funding flow at the end of the year if, if the bills pass rather quickly, but it's more likely that it's next year. Um, so important things that you can be doing now is really planning and coordinating um, as a region, um, 
through SACOG, starting to put together some of the region's priorities around some of the big programs. We're working on putting, I flagged for you guys last week, we're working on putting a document together that has a lot of that information, um, but, but really trying to think through sort of how, um, how and what the priorities are gonna be as this piece comes together while we have this little planning window to work through that because we probably have several months to, to talk about these things, but it's great to be ahead of the curve and it's great to know sort of what, what the region is focused on so that you can be ready when the opportunities do come about. Um, and that's it that I have for the presentation, but I'm happy to answer any questions, happy to talk more about sort of anything that's coming up in your world. Just let us know we're, we're here and happy to, to help out. Great, thank you, Devin, for the presentation. Uh, any questions at this point? comments. Devin, I, I'll start off here. I, I do have a question in, in terms of advocacy. Is there anything that we should be doing both as a as a body as well as individual uh, you know, council members and supervisors to their uh, to the congressional delegation? Or is it still more of a wait and see at this point uh, in terms of getting in any specific, even not even so much request, but maybe if there's any type of uh, advocacy we should be doing with with our congressionals. We've been coordinating really closely with James and Eric and Sabrina and, and, and folks on how and when to engage them. We've had many conversations and I think James has um, also pinged folks where it was appropriate, where we needed an extra push. Um, so I think all of that is in a good spot. There may be opportunities this month as we get a sense of what will this look like and do we want to make a big push on, on some of the final issues. So we should we should have a pretty good sense of that coming up. Great, thank you. And then on a question on a, so I, I, I know the the mods, the, the Democrat mods kind of uh, forced, not forced, but got the speaker to agree to a, a date. Um, but that, so that date and um, that date and that um, timeline is still, can I mean, it's still all up in the air still though, even though they, she gave them a date. Dates are great, <laughs> but there's um, there's nothing that's really forcing their hand on that date. So they agreed to that day. I'm sure they will try to to move something by that date to appease folks. They would certainly um, create a problem if they were trying to move something else. So yes, it's an important date, but um, as with all things in Congress, it's just up in the air right now. So it's a good date to watch. We will most certainly. Jason and I will be living our lives around that date, but um, but it, it may not be the, the final say. I'll just add, I think at some point, if there isn't going to be a vote on September 27th, they'll need to begin to act on an extension of the FAST Act. So that, that likely cannot happen in sort of 48 hours. In the past, it has, but there's unanimous agreement on it. Um, I, I think there's strong pressure to move this bill in light of uh, the infrastructure bill, especially from the moderates you mentioned, um, and that if, if they can't get it across the finish line, there will be, um, there will need to be some planning ahead to sort of get an extension of the FAST Act. So I think that, you know, well, the 27th is an important date. If by September 22nd, for example, they, they change their strategy, um, they'll have to begin to mechanically do some other things to extend the FAST Act that we'll pick up on. Thank you. Any other comments? All right, seeing none. Uh, again, um, Jason and Devin, thank you so much for the update. Um, I think we'll all be waiting to see how this rolls out. September is going to be a, as you say, it's going to be just insane. So, uh, with everything else that's going on. So, Thanks again. And then, yeah, just let us know if there's anything that we need to do uh, individually or as a body. And I, I think uh, everybody here would be more than willing to, to, you know, make those efforts, to do those efforts. Absolutely will. Hopefully we'll have more fun details and lots more funding by the end of the month. Absolutely. Music to all of our ears. All right. Thanks again. Um, we will now then go ahead and move on to item five, uh, which is an update on our green. Sure. Oh, Sarah yeah. Gosa, we have a state, we have a state advocacy update. Oh, Still that's right. The good old California. That's right. Part two here. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Question. Yes. 
are our federal offices open now? I mean, are, are you able to go into congressional office buildings and meet with the members or are those still places still isolated? I don't know if our member, if our um, lobby is oh, I'm sorry. Yet. sorry. Um, I just had to unmute. Yeah, the, it's um, every office is different. So they each have their own rules. There is limited access um, just because they have to, there are, are rules in place because of January 6th about coming in and out of the building and who can be in the buildings. And so um, it's just, it's, it's much more limited. Everything though is still going pretty smoothly because there's lots of virtual meetings. And so those are, those are uninterrupted. You say there's Zoom meetings? Yep, all kinds of virtual, you know, Zoom, Teams, we've seen them all. <laughs> okay, I'm just thinking, September is sounding like a real mashup. Sometimes you really want to be part of it if it's going to happen. And I'm wondering how we, uh, whatever we can do to be influential, we want to do. Thank you. Yeah, and we, um, don't, we are, we have no trouble talking to folks and meeting with them and, and having meetings, but, um, but to protect everyone, there is, there is somewhat limited in-person meetings still. But yes, we are, we are happily engaging with folks. Thank you. Thanks, Devin. All right, so a quick state advocacy update for you. The legislature reconvened on August 16th and they had until August 27th to get any fiscally related bills out of the um, appropriations committees. So I'm gonna give a overview um, of the bills where the bills are that SACOG has taken a position on, a budget update related to transportation funding more specifically, and then SB 375 related legislation, and then a quick update on some Brown Act legislation. So for the bills that SACOG has taken a position on, there is a handout posted and you um, should have received that electronically since the deadline was August 27th. We just updated this um, Friday to get it uh, to reflect everyone, all the bills that had made it out of appropriations. The only bill that is going to become a two-year bill that is different from the last time you saw this handout is AB 915, which would have expanded the category of small business qualified to seek a bid preference through disadvantaged business enterprises. So that will now become a two-year bill all the other bills that we have taken a position on are moving forward. Um, and the, save for the few that had already died earlier. And then um, I wanted to call out on SB 10. That one is the farthest along. This bill would give flexibility to governments by providing a streamlined path for rezoning in infill areas with up to 10 units of residential um, density if the parcel is located in a transit rich area or urban infill site. So it's, um, you know, jurisdictions can already rezone um, these single family lots, but this it provides a more streamlined process um, to not have to go through CEQA. So that's now back in the Senate um, with concurrence and assembly amendments pending. And um, I also wanted to mention that AB 1401, which the board had considered taking a position on at the last board meeting, that is now also a two-year bill. Um, and um, SACOG did not take a position on that, but we'll continue to watch that for you. That was the one that would have eliminated um, parking minimum requirements in transit uh, areas with high transit service. On the budget side, I wanted to call out again, a reminder that there was a $600 million statewide program that you'll hear more about in the next item on your agenda that was modeled very much off of our Green Means Go program. And SACOG region will receive 34, approximately 34 million in formula funds. And then there's also another $30 million pot of um, competitive funds that we could go after. Some funds, um, should be available as soon as January. And this program 
as I said, very much aligns with Green Means Go and in, no doubt exists in large part due to our adv advocacy efforts there. While it's not the 100 million that we were seeking, it's significant that our efforts resulted in garnering these funds for the region. And we're continuing to look for additional opportunities to secure more funding um, at the state and federal levels. And then on the transportation funding specifically, there's um, nearly 6 billion in additional transportation funds that were part of the state budget. But the release of those funds is contingent upon additional legislation that needs to come out. And that those discussions seem to have seem to still be stalled over high-speed rail, that the governor wants 4.2 billion in high-speed rail funding. And there is um, some pushback from the assembly caucus on that amount. So we have not seen any additional trailer bill language yet, but we'll continue to monitor that. The legislature has until September 10th to um, pass bills to get them to the governor. And then on SB 375 related legislation, there's one um, of the three bills that we've been tracking that are related to SB 375 changes. 1147 is the one of the three bills that is still uh, moving forward. It's moved to the Senate floor now. Friedman staff has made a number of amendments over the last month in consultation with MPOs, labor, environmental groups, the league, and CSAC. So there's currently no opposition to the bill. Um, you can see here some of the requirements it sets forth, making changes to SB 150, um, progress reporting, some add some new data requirements and explicitly calls out that public outreach efforts um, be in disadvantaged communities and um, a, a requirement that OPR develop guidance on developing a 15 minute community and that Caltrans would submit a proposal for development of a bicycle highway pilot and select two sites throughout the state. Um, this bill did have an SES block grant, but that was removed um, because the language aligned with the program that created the $600 million pot of funding for the Green Means Go work. So that is no longer in this bill. And the two other bills are SB 475 and SB 261. We are continuing to track those. They are two-year bills. And um, SACOG and other MPOs have met with Cortese's and Allen's offices, as well as staff from environmental quality and transportation in the Senate committees. And we're giving feedback to them on what we would like to see in terms of SB 375 changes. And so we'll keep you updated on those discussions as they move forward. This is going to be a big priority for us over the next year. So we'll continue to keep you updated. And then finally, I just wanted to touch on Brown Act legislation. There's a bill that's becoming an urgency bill, AB 361. So, Sabrina, yes. I'm just gonna interrupt you real fast. I, I saw uh, Vice Chair Koslowski has his hand up. I wasn't, if it was sure. on a specific bill before we got too far Please. past it. Thank, thank you very much. Um, could you could you back up to yeah. your uh, slide about AB 1147? Mm -hmm. Right there. Yeah. What could you elaborate a little bit on makes changes related to local regional relationship? How do you, yeah, I, I guess I, I haven't read the bill all the way through. So what is what do you mean by that exactly? Yeah, there's um, there's some language in there that talks about local jurisdictions coordinate or meeting with the MPO. Um, particularly if there's projects that might not align with the SCS and talking through like what are the challenges for implementing SCS and projects that align with those and barriers to it. So it just um, sets up a more structured relationship for something that we already do with local jurisdictions in terms of um, touching base with them on their general plans when we're updating our MTP SCS. I don't know, Casey, if you wanted to, if you're on here to weigh in, she, she's been a little more involved in those um, discussions on this legislation. As you, as you probably know from past comments I've made at this meeting and the main board meeting, 
formalizing things by the state that we already do as a matter of course is really annoying to me. Yeah, I I understand. Casey, I don't know if you're on here. Oh, you are there. Uh, yes, I'm here. I, you you summarize that really well, Sabrina. Um, the, I think the only nuance I'd add is that it, it, it formalizes the option for the MPO to uh, request um, a meeting or request a conversation with the jurisdiction. So I do, I mean, we hear, we hear what you're saying, Director Kozlowski. Yeah, but does that mean that the jurisdiction has to respond? I mean, is that what it's really formalizing? And that part, I think it does. Sabrina, I'm not sure what the most recent <laughs> language there, is in there's that. No, but yeah. There's no point in formalizing the fact right. that you can call Elaine Anderson at the city of Folsom and ask her a question, right? right? Whether or not she is compelled to respond to you is the only thing that you would need to formalize so that she doesn't tell you to just you know, do your job and leave her alone. You know? right. right. Yeah, right. it does have some, some language in there about um, that. I would say that the League and CSAC were both active in the most recent amendments and are not opposing. Um, not taking a support position either, but not opposing uh, the bill. So I think that they've worked through that language specifically where it really is just a, a point of, you know, trying to get some greater coordination in regions where that might not be happening as much as it does in ours. Can I, can I okay. add, sorry, here's, I got, I, there's one other thing that was added. It, it was a more recent addition to this for um, the local regional relationship that local agencies are, there's a requirement in the bill that they're, they have to report to SACOG annually on their SCS implementation activities. Um, and that is, that is something that we are more concerned about in part because we know that that is an additional level of work that that local agencies would have to do. Um, however, we are also sort of deferring to where CSAC and um, the league are on that. And so as Sabrina said, they are currently neutral. Yeah, I just, I have a generalized concern that the state of California is trying to dissolve local zoning ordinances, period, bit by bit by bit by bit. So anyway, we can move on. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. No, good questions on, on that to get us a better understanding of that language. So thank you. Yeah, and I do recall that there was some language adding that specifically calls out the um, local agencies reserve local land use control. So I know that was definitely a big part of um, the discussions that League and CSAC were having to make sure the amendments met what the locals were looking for. Um, so Brown Act legislation, we have a bill that allow, would allow local agencies to continue teleconferencing without complying with specific Brown Act restrictions around um, public noticing and, and noticing your home, for example, as a place where a meeting was taking place under certain state emergencies is what this bill would do. It's being made an urgency bill to try and see if it can get through before the executive order expires on September 30th to give agencies some more flexibility and that there wouldn't be a gap in the expiration of that um, executive order. And then there's a related uh, bill to that AB 339 that would require cities and um, counties to that are over 250,000 in population to provide both an in-person and a teleconference option for members of the public to attend their meetings until um, this end of December, 2023. So it's getting to that public health piece of it. And it says in the AB 339 that additional changes would be made to government code that are proposed in 361 but only if both bills pass and if 339 passes after 361. So they seem to be um, tied together there. And of course, we'll be closely monitoring this for 
what it means for all of you locally, but also for our regional agency and um, how we move forward with our public meetings in the coming months. So with that, I would be happy to answer any additional questions on state advocacy updates. Thank you, Sabrina. Any other questions on state advocacy comments? I, I will say on the um, uh, the transport or the, the sort of the the tiff between the governor and the assembly on high speed rail. My my crystal ball says that the the four point two billion will likely stay, but as in everything, in order to get there, they'll probably add additional dollars into the bookends, uh, Los Angeles and San Francisco, probably to the tune of around two billion to get to a um, agreement with the speaker on uh, HSR. Um, I just don't think they wanna go down that road of, uh, of passing something and then risking a veto. So my guess is that extra money will come out of DOF to, to get that done, but we'll, we shall see. Yes, hoping you're right on that. It would <laughs> be quite sad to, to not have that money after all, so. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Sabrina. Okay, we're gonna go ahead, we'll see it's 11.15, so we'll go ahead and kind of move quickly through these next items. Um, and we're gonna move on to item five, which is uh, the Green Means Go pilot program update. And uh, Casey has it for us this morning. Thank you, Casey. Yes, good morning. Uh, this is a status update on funding for Green Means Go. Sabrina kind of teed up um, the, the item in her advocacy update. So um, the state uh, does have funding. It's the first of its kind regional early action um, planning grant program of 2021 um, that SACOG will be receiving about $34 million out of. Um, it really was due to three years of concerted advocacy uh, that uh, the Sacramento region did for Green Means Go. Again, to accelerate infill development uh, in the region um, and implement the, the region's sustainable community strategy. So that funding, uh, there's, a, there's still a lot of questions about it. There will be guidelines that are produced. It is also on a tight time frame, And so uh, staff wanted to uh, take the opportunity to give a briefing to the um, PI committee on what the current status is of that. And we've actually invited um, Jennifer Tendick from CalCog to give you a briefing on that because they have been partners in advocating for this um, with us and the other MPOs and have been working pretty closely to get information out of state agencies on its implementation. So with that, I will turn it over to Jennifer. Thank you, Jennifer. Hi, thanks, Jennifer Tendick um, with CalCog, Director of Planning Policy. Thanks for having me. Um, I know we're running short on time, so I am going to skip a lot of my intro and just get right into the timing issue that Casey is talking about. Um, the REAP 2 timing is tight. Um, the statute says that funds must be expended by June of 2024, um, and that's less than 30 months from when the funding would be available. So at CalCog, we know this is a big issue. We are working um, at trying to help fix it. Our executive director, Bill, who many of you know, is actively engaged on this. So I would very much say it's a work in progress. Um, and while I definitely cannot predict what the legislature will do, but we do anticipate that there will be a cleanup bill. And that's one avenue where this could be addressed. Um, another is just through um, how the state agencies end up interpreting the language in the statute. Um, but overall, we're hoping that the expenditure deadline will get moved back, um, hopefully by at least about a year. The funding for REAP2 is from the Federal American Rescue Plan funds, and we know those funds must be obligated by December of 2024, expended by December of 2026. So we really are hoping to see some flexibility with the June 2024 expenditure deadline that's in the statute right now. Um, in terms of program rollout, MPOs, as Casey mentioned, MPOs are eligible for the first 10% of funds in January. My personal interpretation of the statute is like, is that this is like your get ready money. 
that it's more for staffing needs and outreach and figuring out your plan for the funding than it is for actual implementation. However, that's, that is my interpretation. There are four state agencies that are partnering to administer REAP 2.0. Um, so it really will be at their discretion. The primary agency will be HCD, the Housing and Community Development Department, but they are collaborating with the California Air Resources Board, the Strategic Growth Council, and the Governor's Office of Planning and Research. So together they will be um, developing the application materials and um, approving applications once they come in. Right now, it is my understanding that the four agencies are beginning to meet, but there is a lot to still be worked out. The governor just signed um, that bill last month. So there is still a lot of staffing up happening at these agencies. It's very, very early, too early to give um, really a good near-term schedule. Again, we know the application for the first 10% will be available in January. We've talked with all the state agencies involved and know that they do wanna collaborate with CalCOG and the MPOs. So I suspect that we'll be having more conversations and getting more information on that sort of near-term timeline in the next month or two. But I think right now, the only message I really have to share is that the four agencies just need the time to come together and really get this going. Um, Casey, if there's anything else, I guess the one other thing I would say on legislative intent, and I won't get into it too much because Casey mentioned it and so did Sabrina, but the idea that SDS implementation needs funding at the regional level is, um, I think, a state recognition that is we're now seeing happening um, over the last few years, and your efforts around Green Means Go have been really instrumental in getting that message to the state. There isn't really a one size fits all solution. And even though there are the state um, grant programs that are helpful with SCS implementation, again, they struggle with that, that there isn't a one size fits all solution. So I do think this is a really big opportunity for MPOs to show and, and demonstrate um, that, that you guys have the strategies and you understand the needs of your regions and can uh, make implementation greater with this type of funding. So I'll stop there. Um, if there's anything else you want me to talk about, Casey, I will. Otherwise, I'll be here to answer questions if there are any. Great, thank you, Jennifer. Casey, anything else you wanted to add? No, we are now just here for any questions. All right, great. I guess, you know, one question I had, and I don't know if it's, obviously it was a big victory just to get the 600 million into the budget, but, you know, we've obviously put a lot of effort and, and time and thoughtfulness into this, into this process. Um, has there been, I mean, knowing what other MPOs are doing and, and what's been around the state, do you foresee any conversations about sort of the next chapter in this, if, you know, if there would be funds potentially uh, beyond this sort of one one time allocation, um, you know, maybe in the in the next budget. Obviously, I mean, I love the fact that we have thirty four million or thirty six, whatever the, the amount is, and and the ability to compete maybe for a few more dollars. But didn't know if there's been any um, conversations about sort of two point oh, if you will. Um, you, James and Casey, you guys can jump in. I think at at CalCog, right? That's our hope. We're hoping to be able to be the biggest champions of all of you and show the state um, all of the great work that will be coming out of this fund, out of the use of these funds. And so I think that's a, a goal for sure, how much the conversations have been had since uh, the program just sort of designed right now. I don't, I don't know that. And Chair Saragosa, we're uh, we're having exactly that conversation with our uh, with also our our advocacy consultants, KP Public Affairs, coming up here in the next month, uh, which is really uh, which we'll come back to, of course, uh, to the to this committee because it's really about our if we were all in on Green Means Go this last 12, 24, 30 months, um, do we do that? Is it worth doing it again? You know, risk reward or or are we looking at maybe actually um, broadening our agenda slightly uh, for some policy bills. Um, anyway, we, we, we'll, we'll keep you updated, but it's an excellent question because if there is a possibility of building on this, I, I, I think we, we sure don't want to give that up. Agreed. 
All right, thank you. Any other questions or comments? All right, seeing none, do we have uh, any uh, public comments? No public comment. All right, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you both uh, for the update. Um, we'll check in again on this and uh, we will go to our next item, uh, which is an update on our uh, REI uh, working group. And um, our fearless leader has this for us today. Well, thanks, Chair Sergios, and I certainly invite uh, you and um, Director Ferrix and the other folks who were on, Director Gog, on uh, the Race, Equity, Inclusion Working Group from Friday. This is a pretty hot off the presses report out, so apologies for not having anything written in front of you, but uh, it, it did just wrap up on Friday afternoon. This was the second meeting of the Race, Equity, Inclusion Working Group uh, this calendar year. Uh, there was one more scheduled in November. Uh, we had a uh, guest speaker, uh, Charles Brown, uh, president and CEO of Equitable Cities and professor at Rutgers University, um, somebody who I've known for quite some time, uh, and I think is one of the uh, preeminent um, scholars and academics and researchers on the, uh, the intersection between the built environment, race, equity, uh, public health. Uh, so we had a really engaging discussion in fact, uh, uh, Director Jennings, who of course chairs REI, actually uh, let that discussion go because it was so rich. If you remember, we have 10 board members on the REI working group. We also have 10 external members who are really proving to be, I think, excellent resources and really adding to um, the level, I think, of discussion and debate. Um, so, uh, so just in terms of Charles Brown and this, uh, the, the video is, I believe, now up on our on our REI working group uh, site, and also a preview that also Charles Brown, Professor Brown is coming to the full board in September. So th this was a, uh, a really rich conversation and he had a lot of things he covered. I wanna pull three kind of themes out, at least from my end. One was, uh, I think he did an excellent job of really talking about the term equity, of defining equity, talking about the different aspects and types of equity. Um, but really uh, focusing on, on racial equity, equity by race and ethnicity, and the importance of race in a lot of these decisions uh, and policies and planning in terms of transportation in particular. So, so that, uh, that conversation, even touching on things that, uh, that, that we've had discussions on this year at the full board, like the difference between equity and equality, uh, I think he did a really, really nice job of, of, of digging deep in, in that, and we had a very an excellent discussion and result. Uh, secondly, um, he touched a number of times on the importance of engaging people and residents, uh, especially in transportation planning. Um, he talked a lot about um, some of the research and the work he has done, and even I think the, the habit of, I shall say, planners and engineers of sometimes thinking about the physical fixed objects and street lights and infrastructure rather than the actual people. And he, I think, made a very strong case for engaging current residents, especially residents of color, uh, low income residents, and a lot of the transportation planning efforts um, and really made the case that we have not, uh, we've not done a good job of that. And I, I would heartily agree. And then third, I think um, his work on the intersection between transportation planning and public health, I think really, really came through. And the power of the built environment, the physical environment and going upstream um, uh, from sometimes even blaming people for individual actions uh, and pedestrians for uh, their own fatalities or injuries, which is, uh, has been very common, but going upstream sort of using a public health model and looking at the, the determinants uh, in terms of race, ethnicity, income, the physical environment, um, and I think really making that connection. He, um, in the work that I've known him for around pedestrian safety in particular, uh, he presented some, um, some really startling statistics um, about the racial inequities in terms of pedestrian fatalities and injuries. And he had talked about how he challenged all regional planning agencies uh, a few years ago to look at the racial disparities in pedestrian injuries and fatalities. And I will say, I hope uh, that you all saw the um, Sacramento Bee yesterday that actually had a multiple page um, 
several articles on this topic, uh, incredibly, remarkably timed um, after this discussion on Friday and uh, happy to send that around for you all. And then, um, so that took up most of the meeting, just a quick, uh, quick summary of the, uh, some of the other things. We also had a presentation from Darren Connolly um, on our staff for our project evaluation planning tool, our PEP tool, um, which is going to be, uh, we're, we're rolling out for this upcoming MTP SCS, looking at how we can bring data, especially equity data and racial equity data into the evaluation of transportation projects. Uh, we had one final um, agenda item that because that discussion with Charles Brown was so rich, we moved that and Chair Jennings decided to kick that to November. But I do want to, um, since this really you are the committee that's going to hear the updates from the REI working group, a racial equity statement, a statement of commitment or a resolution uh, is on the docket. Our staff has done some research. Um, uh, uh, the California Transportation Commission, Caltrans, our other fellow MPOs from within the state around the country, looking at their equity statements um, as what we hope will be an inspiration for developing something that we'd like the board to consider um, later this calendar year. So that was kicked to the November REI working group meeting, but it will be coming back uh, to the full board. So as I said, the next REI working group meeting is in in November. Uh, Chair Jennings closed the meeting with uh, one final thing, which is, and I think he's, you're going to hear this from uh, from him at the full board too. He uh, he asked the REI working group members uh, to dig into a book called The Sum of Us uh, by Heather McGee. Uh, it's a history of racism and uh, racial inequality in especially public policy and government decision making over time. Um, and so he's challenged the uh, REI working group to read that book along with him. We're going to be working with him and the working group to find a time, we hope in person, for, perhaps virtually, uh, Chair Jennings feels very strongly about this. Try to get together in person uh, if you can. And I think he's going to be, uh, I think he's going to be passing this along to many of you as well, full board meeting. So with that, that uh, I'll conclude my kind of update of the REI working group meeting and be happy to get any other um, report outs from, from board members who are there Friday. Thank, thank you, James. Uh, and I'll, I don't know, Director Ferrix, if you had any thoughts you wanted to, to share, then I'll, I'll share a couple of my thoughts on my end. Sure, happy to, do, very quickly. I mean, I, I think that was a pretty fantastic overview, firstly. Uh, so not much to add, but just except for, I think, how um, high quality the discussion was. Um, it has been consistently, but um, I thought the presentation um, by Charles was fantastic. And I think, but really to, to allow for us to um, uh, not sort of be so time bound to the agenda and to actually have, uh, I mean, sort of go into more depth on the different aspects of the discussion um, was very, very important. And I, you know, yeah, couldn't help but, <laughs> um, find it pretty fascinating that the Sacramento Bee did have that whole series of articles this weekend um, on uh, basically on the same sort of topics around um, how, you know, how transportation planning and how um, pedestrians are, you know, uh, have been significantly impacted in the Sacramento region um, based on, you know, obviously which neighborhoods they live in and, you know, which race they are. So it's, I think that there's a lot to be said for um, that, that sort of public health approach um, that Charles was talking about and um, looking forward to further discussions with, um, you know, the larger uh, board uh, on some of these topics. And it, frankly, I'm really happy to hear he's attending the upcoming board meeting because um, it's one thing for 10 of us or so to hear um, uh, from him. But um, I think that the, if the entire SACOG board will find it a pretty enriching um, discussion. No, I, 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 thank, thank you, Lucas. And same, I mean, I almost thought, wow, James, you know, had a whole article written in the SAC B the next day. Uh, after or a couple of days later, when I saw it come out in yesterday's paper, it, it really did help. I, I thought crystallize what Charles was talking about, and I mean, I'll say I'll be the first one to say I had never really thought about sort of that um, about people of color and how streets are done and and fatalities. It, it, something that never crossed my mind. And then you look at the data and and you look at what he presented and what was in the SAC B, and it's you know it's hard to to argue that that those things aren't happening and aren't aren't real. 
and, and so it was very enlightening, I, I thought, from my end. Uh, and I, I did the same. I thought the uh, we had a really robust conversation. And I like the fact that we just sort of moved the agenda around to be able to have that conversation. And I do think it'll be fruitful for the entire board to hear this. Um, I'd love to be that if we were going to be in person, but I think James also mentioned that uh, there'll be a, a segment at this. Hopefully, if we're at, at our October, um, yes, fingers crossed, hopefully for our October, uh, uh, I just lost the word. Uh, the board retreat. Yeah, the board retreat. retreat. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not thinking this morning. Um, so that I think will will be good. The, only, the other thing I, I thought that came out of that was... Um, we sort of realize that there's just so much that we're wor working on here and it's such uncharted territory, if you will, that the consensus, at least amongst the board members, was that we might even need more meetings to do this. And I know, it, and thankfully the, the question was asked uh, of, well, does this can staff actually uh, handle more more of these meetings? Is it just more work for staff? And so I think we're going to take a look at that and see if if we do need to have uh, more meetings than just quarterly. So that's something we'll be taking a look at as well as we move into 2022. Uh, so with that, um, I'll go ahead and open it up for any questions uh, from the board. I guess we we said everything we needed to say then there's no questions all right well thank thank you everyone james thanks for the update on that and, and lucas as well uh and more to come uh on rei uh so with that we'll move to our last uh information item uh which is uh the gearing up for the 2024 uh, mtp scs and uh benu abraham has uh this for us this morning Thank you and good morning. My morning. name is Binu Abraham and I am the project manager for the 2024 MTP SES update. This is an informational item. So let me just start with uh, sharing my screen. Oh, sorry. Okay, so we are starting the kickoff of our MTP SES. MTP SES is the Metropolitan Transportation Plan Sustainable Community Strategy. And we, we, we will be giving, coming up with more information on this as, the, um, as we go on. But I would like to start with a small overview of what is the update process. So what is MTP ACS? Metropolitan Transportation Plan and Sustainable Community Strategies, also known as MTP ACS and or simply the plan, is a long range plan that combines the land use strategies with transportation investments to meet the varying travel needs of the residents in the SACOG region. It's a plan that integrates multi-model transportation system paired with an efficient land use pattern that connects housing to jobs, education, goods and services, and recreational opportunities. We update this plan every four years. Why do we need a plan? There are multiple reasons why we do a comprehensive plan. Some of the obvious ones is that as an MPO, we have to meet certain federal and state requirements and having this plan helps us to meet that requirement. The other reason is the plan is a shared regional vision of its future. It also provides us an opportunity to identify regional priorities and increase our competitiveness for grant. But more than this, there are some other factors or reasons why we do the plan. One of the reasons is that our region is diverse. We are diverse in terms of both communities and our residents. If you look at the whole SACOG region, 80% of our region's land use is classified as rural and 20% is urban or suburban. 
But if you look at the housing, 90% of the housing is located in urban areas and less than 10% in rural areas. We need a plan that will take into account all these factors and give us more transportation or mobility options. As a region, we are a very diverse region in its demographics. In, in 2000, 64% of our, all our residents were non-white, non-Hispanic white, but by 2019, it had shrunk to 51%. The Hispanic and Asian population has continued to grow steadily. Why else do we need a plan? It's because our region is also growing. If you look at this chart, which is the total population by county, you can see that in 2000, we had a population of 1.9 million. And by 2020, it has grown to 2.5 million. Our annual growth population when compared to other California regions shows that we have steady, steady population growth in the last five years as the fastest growing in the state, as, as population growth has in, uh, shifted more inland. S Sacramento and S San Joaquin Valley have reclaimed their status as the fastest growing California regions compared to Los Angeles and San, San Diego and the Bay Area. The transportation challenges we face in our region requires a comprehensive planning effort. Of, of the large metropolitan areas, Sacramento and San Diego have the highest VMT per capita compared to Los Angeles and San Francisco area. While a difference of a few VMT may not seem much, it quickly adds up on a daily per capita basis and in relation to climate, climate goals. So as a, the, we need a plan that can address how we are going to tackle our VMT changes. Our overall road payment condition seems to be deteriorating and we need a strategy to stretch our limited dollars to expand and maintain the transportation system. The, the black dotted line shows the overall road payment condition in the Sacramento region and you can see that it is, it is deteriorating. We also need a plan to address the revenue, pricing and investments. As you all know that the gas tax revenues has been going down recently as vehicles become more gas efficient or they, we have switched to electric or hybrid vehicles. This has caused a decrease in our gas revenue. At the same time, the cost to build new roads and maintain current roads have increased. Both of this lead to not having enough funding to maintain our already existing roads which is becoming more and more expensive to repair over time. So what does the plan do? The plan lays out a path for having more homes near major job centers. It provides more options to get around and provide more accessibility. It also lays out a path for improving our air quality, preserving our open space and natural resources, bolstering our agricultural economy, helping and helping California achieve its goal to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions that contribute to the climate change. We provide more, more transit and other modes of travel. We try to reduce the congestion and delay um, by providing better connected communities and thus reducing the overall drive time. So now that we have looked at what is MTP, why we are doing it and what does the plan do, let's look at how, how do we get the plan? What are the processes involved? There are main, mainly five components of the MTP. The first component is the long range economic forecast or uh, we call it the growth projections. The projections set population employment and housing totals for the plan horizon. The next component is a land use forecast. We collaborate and coordinate with local agency staff and member agencies to come up with the land use forecast. 
we overlay that with transportation revenue and transportation projects. And then the fourth step is we look at the performance measures or the performance outcome on how they help us to achieve the policy goals of the plan. We will be bringing you more information on each of these components um, in, the, in the later months. So what's ahead for this plan? Every plan focuses on a few policy priorities around which we measure all our goals and outcomes. Along with advancing the policy objectives of the previous plan, the staff tries to identify any new focus areas where we, should, where, where we see a need to expand in response to changing needs and challenges. Here are some example focus areas that the staff will be bringing to the board for consideration and, and discussion. This is by no means a full list. It's only a partial list. Um, we are hoping that we can have more discussion around equity and project prioritization and climate resilience, safety, economic prosperity. So what are the major steps in the update process? The staff is working in developing a work plan and a detailed schedule of the plan in the coming months. But at a very high level, these outline the major steps in the plan update. The gavel shows where the board will be taking action on an item. And we, we, we will bring back more detailed um, information regarding the schedule for the entire update process. I promise you, you will be seeing a lot of me over the next two and a half years. So this does not mean the, the, the points where we are having action is only time you will be talking about MTP. The entire process is very iterative and transparent. And so we will be bringing you every step, every process for your consideration and discussion. Before I proceed to the next session of the presentation, I would like to pause and see if there are any questions. Thank you. Any okay. questions? Uh, yes, Director Stollard. Oh, still on mute. Sometimes I wonder if we should offer our condolences that you're gonna to have to chair this separate menu. It's such a lot of work. But, but I know uh, they chose carefully in giving you this opportunity. A secondary grounds is you're gonna to have to talk to us a lot. So I apologize for that, but uh, I appreciate your presentation today. Uh, my question was, I can't even remember all the details now, but uh, we were able to get our last uh, approval of our MTP SCS under the wire before a new requirement kicked in that was quite onerous. Uh, are, how are we positioned relative to that requirement uh, as we go forward with this new MTP SES? Yeah, so we are, are you talking about the conversation with the um, Air Resource Board and the greenhouse gas targets and all the other requirements? Yeah, we are in close conversation with them. We already have coordinations with all the agencies that will be part in some way or the other in this process over the next two and a half years. So we are closely monitoring what is happening in terms of our requirement, what we should meet. And we are having a dialogue with each of these agencies to make sure that we are letting them know of our concerns and our abilities and what, what we should be doing. And just as a follow-up, Perhaps James can weigh in on this. How are the other uh, COGS uh, dealing with the requirements that we were able to uh, basically skate around? Yeah, Director Stollard. Um, you know, uh, so Banu mentioned the greenhouse gas target, and that's going to be a huge one for us. We we are we're kind of skirting. We're just hitting that target. I know MTC just uh, is in the process of just finalizing their plan if they haven't yet fully adopted, um, and, and we're definitely, as I mentioned earlier in this meeting, uh, in, in very close conversation with all of the other major MPOs on this. I think you're also referring to the safe vehicle rule, um, and, and we could certainly come back and give you the latest update on that. That was a, that was a race to the wire. Um, 
that, that we managed to pull off before that went into effect. Uh, unless anybody here on this call wants to give uh, give an update, I would I would ask that the staff kind of works that into future presentations. Um, I, I don't I don't think it's going to be as um, I don't think it's going to be as uh, as critical on this plan cycle, but we're going to have a lot of other a lot of other things to be able to balance for sure. Okay, just kind of wondered what the minefield was looking like. I'll stand by. And direct Director Lozano, I saw your your hand pop up there. I didn't know if you, you had a question still. I, I don't. It was covered. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, Benio, I think you can uh, continue. All right. Thank you. So the next part of the presentation covers the project evaluation process, which is a new process that we are starting in this plan. So the project evaluation as from the name, you understand it has got something to do with performance measures. So why are we talking about it now, even before we have anything else lined up? The reason is that the process evaluation process project evaluation process or PEP as we call it, it falls in the very, uh, in data analytics. And we are all familiar with how complicated and time consuming that portion of the work always is. So we, since this is a new methodology or a new process that we are trying to achieve, um, we want to give it a head start. And Darren, Coley is the project manager of the project evaluation process. Unfortunately, he had a family emergency and he couldn't be here. So I will try to go through the slides and I can answer any questions uh, you might have. If I'm unable to answer it, I will get it back to Darren and have him answer it in the next meeting. So. What is PEP? The, the, the PEP is a new process or a methodology we are trying to come up with to achieve two major deliverables of MTPACS. The one of them is the policy goals of the MTPACS, and the other one is the pro, a list of pro, transportation projects plan to happen over the next 20 something years that are supposed to support these policy goals. But traditionally, there has no, been no element measuring the extent to which each project support a particular MTPACS policy. So we don't know which project most strongly support these. This makes it harder to prioritize projects and to be able to strategically pursue competitive funding. So the PEP's goal is to, is to measure the extent to which each project support an MTP ACS goal. What will PEP do? The PEP is going to have a multi-step process where it will do two things. It will support the development of MTP ACS project list and then it will also help us to measure the degree to which we achieve each of that policy goals. Benefit of PEB. It's a data-driven process to help us understand which projects do the most, of, most to move the needle on the MTP policy goals. It helps to identify which projects are most competitive for state and federal transportation dollars. An example of it would be at, a, at the state level, the California's recently released Climate Action Plan for Transportation Infrastructure or CAPTI, which will likely guide billions of state transportation dollars in coming years based on ability to reduce greenhouse gas and promote resiliency to climate change. Um, and the example at a federal level would be a raise grant program, which currently makes $1 billion available to finance transportation projects based on project alignment with goals such as prom promoting racial equity, environmental sustainability, and economic competitiveness. So how, how will PEP affect my projects? The important thing to clarify here is that the 
PEP is not going to determine whether a particular project is going to be in MTP ACS project list or not. It is just going to inform if a project is in the MTP ACS, how well will it perform when compared to a particular policy goal. With that, this is a little brief out, out overview of how it fits into the larger MTP ACS update process. So this is the timeline for the MTP ACS. And zooming into the early phases of the MTP ACS, it starts with cities and counties nominating projects they would like to be included in the MTP ACS. PEP at this part of the process will initially examine the nominated projects so that SACOG in collaboration with member agencies can develop and finalize the list of projects that end up in the MTP ACS. The PEP's role here performed um, in the previous MTP is to compare the road capacity projects against expected increases in traffic volumes, flagging instances where road capacity increases may not be commensurate with expected decrease in demand. So the, the timeline is, it's, it's not nailed down yet. So we will be coming back to you with exact specific dates on when the PEP process will be happening. At the later portion of the plan, after the SACOG board approves the final list of projects to be included in the MTP, PEP will help inform which project aligns best to each policy goals. With that, I would take any questions that you have about this whole process. All right, thank you, Binyu. Uh, any questions? We got a couple of minutes left here. Not seeing any. I do have some homework, I think, for our, our group here, though, that relates back to this in terms of, you know, how we look at the overall uh, MTP SCS. And that's, you know, e equity is, is something that, you know, is, is a new thing for us in terms of how that will be um, integrated into our MTP SCS. And so I, I want all directors to really think about what equity is going to mean for us in, in terms of how we have that integration and, and to really think through it, because it's going to come here first, I think, to, to P&I to, to really kind of vet that and, and what that might look like as, as it goes to the full body. So I want everyone to just to kind of think through that. And also, you know, if uh, we have the, for those of us on the race and equity uh, uh board you know we have we have a book we'll be reading but maybe we can get that information out uh james to to everyone here as well i just want everyone to kind of think through that because it's a it's a new concept for us you know how we're, we're looking at things and and what that means to us especially in areas say like like plasterville and other areas that are not as racially diverse and you know how, what what that means what that looks like for a project how something is scored uh, because i think i could for, i could foresee conflicts if you know maybe a, a score is less but by no means of just what the the ethnic composition is of an area that say you know is 85 percent caucasian so this i i want this to be just something for everyone to think about as as we move forward here as well staff and and uh board members as well and with that, yes, James, sir. go ahead. Yep, no, yes, I was just gonna um, say. Well, just on, just on your point there, and maybe it's a good one to kind of close out on, um, and Benu did an excellent presentation here. I, I think, um, so, so we hear you on this, and uh, given the work of the REI group, given the fact that I think the question you're asking, uh, I, we see the MTP SES as an opportunity to really explore Right. What do infrastructure and don't forget land use and housing and growth and development patterns? How can we actually narrow racial disparities and and larger income disparities through investments and through growth and development and housing policy? This is the place to begin, I think, to ask those questions. I think what you're hearing from us as staff is we want to explore this in the this upcoming plan because those questions you're going to be asked those same questions at the state level and the federal level to be competitive for grants. And that gets to my other point here, which is 
as Banu put in her very first slide, but I really want to emphasize this, we have to meet all of these state and federal requirements. Um, but also, this is a document that all of your staff use for applications to be competitive. Um, so that's number one. And number two is that don't forget the MTP SES, at least the way I think of it and shorthanded is it really is a very constrained budget. We have budgets on the MTP SES. It's a budget in terms of financial constraint. It's a budget in terms of sort of carbon and greenhouse gas restraint, air quality conformity. And so um, we understand that there will be a lot of uh, dialogue with all of your staffs about is a transportation project in or out? Is a land use or future development project in or out? Uh, and we can't simply say, come one, come all, you're, you're all in, right? I, I know many veterans of you know this, this is a delicate balancing act and it really is a strategy to balance growth, transportation, economic development, equity, environment. Um, so that, but that budget piece of this is really important. That is not a wish list exercise. That would be a lot easier. <laughs> this is a really hard, uh, constrained, and I think increasingly, you know, modeled and data driven exercise that you're going to be very involved in over the next three years. Right. No, thank you, James, for closing that loop. And Binyu, thank you for the really good presentation and really laying out for all of us again the, the entire process here and those those dates, those coming up for us uh, to make decisions. Uh, so with that, unless there's any other comments, um, our next meeting uh, will be Monday, October 4th. And the thing there is, again, hopefully we'll be meeting in person. Uh, we'll see uh, where where we are from a pandemic standpoint uh, and where some of this legislation ultimately ends up as well uh, that uh, would allow potentially for continued um, either hybrid or or um, as we're doing today uh, on, via Zoom. So again, thank you to staff uh, for a lot of information in a, in a short time and for the dialogue with the board members today. So with that, uh, I will adjourn this meeting uh, at one minute past uh, 12 o'clock. So thank you, everyone, and have a good rest of your week. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members. Bye-bye. Thank See you. See you, everybody. Thank you.